welcome to the Bible study for tonight. Welcome to the Bible study tonight. We're going to be examining the book of Mark chapter 6. Hallelujah. Let's open up in prayer. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this opportunity to come together to study your word, to begin to, to really just learn and dissect the word of God from the book of Mark. Father, we thank you, God, that this is an opportunity for us to grow in Bible study uh, as we are watching together online, I pray that, that you would have your Bible with you. You will have a, a pen and a notepad so you can begin to take some notes as the Holy Spirit's going to bring forth some, some revelation tonight in the name of Jesus. Now, one of the keys to looking at this book, the book of Mark, uh, beginning with uh, looking here at chapter 6, we are going to see and we're going to find there is a conflict of faith. There's some there, there, you're going to see a lot of different conflicts, and you're going to see it all centered around this topic of faith. And so this is a key thing as we begin to look at this particular chapter. Now, I'm going to read uh, the first uh, seven verses here from the book of Mark. It says, uh, beginning with verse 1, Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked. What's this wisdom that has been given to him, that, even, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And it says they took Offense at him. Beginning with verse 4, it continues Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on only a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling on the twelve to him. He sent them out two by two, and he gave them authority over evil spirits. Now, I want us to begin to look at some of this. You know, it's interesting, you know, as we begin to understand this conflict of faith, we, we, we inevitably come to this, this point where we begin to understand and grapple with this thing of unbelief and how unbelief challenges faith. That there is a conflict between faith and and unbelief. And you see that here in the beginning of the chapter. You know, it's interesting. Romans chapter 14 verse 23 says that everything that does not come from faith is sin. Scripture is very plain on the matter. Holy, uh, Hebrews 11 uh, chapter 11 verse 6 says without faith it's impossible to please God. So anytime you begin to see unbelief creep in in a matter, you begin to understand that it's already in opposition to faith. It's already sin. Now, unbelief is wicked, so we're not even supposed to entertain these thoughts because what you tolerate will then dominate. Unbelief takes on many forms, including doubting, being cynical, critical, skeptical, even dignified and full of self-reasoning. and asks questions that God is not answering, and it's full of self-justification. Unbelief is safe because it takes no risks and it gets exactly what it expects. You know, and it's sad because unbelief is actually faith in something other than God. It's faith in another God. Romans chapter 1 verse 25 says, They exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. This inevitably becomes what we see here. Because you begin to see the people of the town begin to say, who is this? They reject God in the flesh to worship a religious idea created by their own imaginations. This is what unbelief does. It exchanges the truth for a lie. And it's interesting because we begin to see here that they don't understand what happens. And they say, where did this man get these things? And they took offense at him. And you know, it's interesting because a couple of verses later, it says that he was amazed at their lack of faith. This is the second time in all of scripture that Jesus and his humanity was amazed. There's only two times. 
The first time he's amazed is when he meets the Roman centurion soldier, and he's amazed because of his faith. But here he's amazed for the exact opposite reason. He's amazed because of their lack of faith. Unbelief is usually offended at the package. It doesn't look like what they expect it or really demand it to look like. So we got to be careful because sometimes the Holy Spirit sends Jesus in a package that we're not accustomed to see. You have to be careful not to reject something or someone just because they don't look or just because it doesn't, isn't presented in the way that you perceive that it would look. They were bickering at the vessel that stood before them. You know, the people were so familiar with Jesus and his family that they took offense at him. And thus, they refused to receive what God had already preordained for them to receive. This still happens today. We have to be careful. We have to be very careful to walk in the fear of God, not to reject anything and everything around us because we don't want to reject the package, in which case the Holy Spirit brings something to us. And if you look at it, it even says there in the text that he could not, Jesus himself, Jesus was 100% God, but he was also 100% man. Jesus was 100% man in the flesh, Jesus incarnate. And here, here he is operating under the power of the unction of the Holy Spirit. And it says that he could not do but only a few miracles. So a lot of us are expecting Jesus. It's not that Jesus wasn't capable, but you have to understand that the unbelief has very the, the, the spirit of unbelief has very restrictive barriers. And it says he could only do a few miracles there. This should communicate the importance of faith. Jesus the Christ was only able to perform a few miracles because that location didn't possess the heart of faith. Unbelief at best flatlines. Because it has no expectation. Now, faith is key because faith is connecting. It links, it connects, it gets plugged into God. That's the essence of what faith is. Faith literally connects. It connects like Wi-Fi. It connects like when you take your pl a plug to something and you plug it into the socket. Faith is that connecting point between you and God through the Spirit. Faith connects, and unbelief never connects. It is disconnected. It is not connected to what, to what God is doing. But when you connect with what God is doing in the moment, when you connect with God in that moment, boom, something begins to happen. And we're going to see that here as we go further in the text. But this is, this is a big thing that we, that, that, that we have to tackle here at the beginning of this chapter, this issue of unbelief. Because Jesus is going to challenge it again and again and again throughout this chapter. And the beginning we begin to see this issue of the hardening of the heart. Of, 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 a, of the spirit of offense. And how offense moves with the spirit of unbelief. It says they took offense at him. You know, they, you know and, and this, is a, this is an issue. They took offense at Jesus. Because they rejected the package. You know, that, 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 that ultimately becomes the bottom line here when we begin to look at unbelief. And you got to understand that unbelief is, is, is like cancer. Matter of fact, I believe that many of the cancers that we see and that we experience today is actually the manifestation of the spirit of offense. Hallelujah. Unbelief doesn't, doesn't want God to move. In fact, it resists him at every side. And know this, and I mentioned this earlier, what you tolerate will dominate. So if you tolerate offense, if you tolerate unbelief, if you tolerate these things, it will have a lasting effect on that location. Now, if we begin to look at it, verse 7, it's interesting because... Excuse me, the end of verse 6, it says, Then Jesus went around teaching from village to village. In other words, Jesus never stayed in that place. Jesus never stayed in his hometown. 
Jesus didn't stay in a place that was full of unbelief. Now, now, as I mentioned earlier, he called forth the twelve, and he gave, and, and he sent them out two by two, and he gave them authority over evil spirits. Verse 8, these were his instructions. Take nothing for your journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra tunic. Whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave that town. If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off of your feet and leave as a testimony against them. They went out and they preached that people should repent. They drove out many demons and anointed many sick people with oil and healed them. Now it's interesting. The disciples didn't respond in the same way. They began to receive the instruction of Jesus and then they followed through. Now, it's interesting when we begin to look at some of the instructions that Jesus said. He, you now see him now give the instruction on what he did. Jesus preached, and when they didn't receive him in his hometown, he shook the dust off of his feet. In other words, he didn't let any of the remnants, he didn't let any of the dust particles of even that unbelieving town remain on him. No, he went from village to village. He left that place. And he went about seeking those who were open to receiving by faith. Then he gives the disciples the same instruction. I want you to go town by town, two by two, and if someone receives you, stay there. Why? Because those people have faith. Those people have faith that is active, it's alive, and it's ready to receive you with arms wide open. And when you see that moment of opportunity, you take full advantage and you bless them. And you stay there until you go on to the next place, until you get received the next instruction, which is to go to the next house or to, or excuse me, to the next village. So in other words, Jesus is giving them very specific instructions. When you see that moment, that window of opportunity of faith, you take full advantage of it. This happens all the time. When you go about in your workplace, when you go about... And you're shopping in, in the marketplace. When you see the opportunity of that hungry heart, you got to pour into it. you got to lean into it because you got to see and recognize the moment of opportunity because that person's heart is now open. Now, it's interesting as we begin to look in, 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 in verse 11, it says, If any place should not welcome you or, li or listen to you, shake the dust off of your feet and leave. It means you don't stay there. You don't stay in a place of unbelief. You don't stay in a posture. You don't stay in a position. And you don't stay in a location that is full of the disease of unbelief. And trust me, it is a spiritual disease that will, that will cause decay of, of your spiritual walk with Jesus. You don't cultivate that kind of relationship. If somebody doesn't cultivate a relationship of faith, you, you're, not supposed, you're not supposed to continue in that relationship. You're supposed to leave. And that might be a word for somebody tonight. You know, we're supposed to cultivate good, healthy relationships. We're supposed to cultivate relationships that build faith and that release faith. People pour into you and you pour into others. Jesus here is pouring into his disciples. And as he's pouring into them, he's giving them good instruction on when to stay and when to go. And these are important matters of the heart that we need to be paying attention to. Now, it's interesting as Jesus gave them instruction. To heal the sick to, and, and to cast out demons and to tell them the kingdom of God's at hand. And it says here that they preach the people should repent. So here they are preaching the good news of the kingdom and demonstrating it. Because when you begin to release a word, God always meets it with demonstration. So there is always the manifestation of the demonstration of the kingdom. But there's what, what that, that accompanies when you share the word. So when you share your faith. Don't be afraid to pray for them if they are feeling sick, if they have gone through emotional trauma or any kind of thing. God will meet you there because they are already open because of their faith. If they're a person that's open right now, that they're letting you there and they're listening to you, they're now already open. This is what the scripture is saying. we got to recognize when it's closed and when it's open because if you go somewhere and they're like, I don't want to hear it, they might not be open. But if you are listening to what to what that what to, to 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 what they're saying when you begin to share, because you get you can listen with your spiritual ears and your natural ears. 
If they are open and they are listening to you, you now have an open audience to share the gospel. And as you share the gospel, you can pray for them. And the Holy Spirit will meet you with whatever it is that that individual needs at that moment. The Holy Spirit will meet you there. And Jesus is giving us these kinds of authorities. And it's interesting. It says, you know, it says they preach the, me the message of that they should repent and they begin to do these signs and wonders. And in verse 14, it says, King Herod heard about this for Jesus name had become well known. It's interesting to me that Jesus name became well known. They, the apostles, these disciples never made it about them. They never made it about their ministry. They never made it about, about who they are and what they're doing. They made it all about Jesus. And as such, the news went all over town, including to King Herod. The king heard about it, about the name of Jesus and what Jesus was doing through these men. This is the important key to understanding how to unlock the key and use the keys of the kingdom. Now, Jesus' name had become well known. The fame of the name of Jesus is now spreading. And this is awesome. I also find it very interesting that when these disciples begin to go out, Jesus gave them instruction not to take bread, no bag, no money, no belts, uh, because this now caused them to become dependent versus independent, self-reliant. Sometimes we become so independent and so, so self-reliant that we stop being dependent on the Holy Spirit. And we stop being led by the Spirit because now we're being led by our own natural flesh and the natural surroundings around us. You know, this is why as a church we're fasting right now because we're wanting to crucify some flesh and begin to see the release of the breakthrough of the Spirit. So this is interesting. When you look at verse 9, he says, do not take an extra tunic. You know, an extra tunic per night was helpful because... It helped pr protect them from the cold air because, you know, a desert might be hot when the sun's overhead, but when the sun sets and it's, and it's pitch black outside, it's cold. And as such, you know, they usually would take an extra tunic for the journey, but Jesus is saying, don't take that. So the implication here is that the disciples were to trust God in providing lodging for each night. And if they didn't receive it, they were supposed to continue to move on until they received that open door. He's teaching them how to be led by the Spirit and how to be dependent on God. If you catch what he's saying here, the Holy Spirit's giving us an opportunity on how to be led by the Spirit, looking for those moments of opportunity, those moments of, of open doors, and not to be self-reliant. That's so, so important, particularly in this fast, that we don't become self-focused and self-reliant and self um, Providing, We allow the Holy Spirit to begin to provide all of our needs according to his riches and his glory in his timing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to skip forth here. We we're at verse 14. I'm going to go ahead and move on to uh, looking at verse 30 here. Now, it's interesting. The apostles gathered around Jesus and they reported to him all that they had done and taught. Now, now they're giving Jesus the report of everything that they had done in his name. And then it says in verse 31, Then, because many of the people were coming and going, they did not even get a chance to eat. So, you know, he says, you know, come, come with me let, let, by yourselves. In other words, let's not have a big crowd. Come with me by yourselves and let's go to a place of rest. He's trying to teach them the importance of rest because even after doing all of the work and all of the ministry and all of the activities in life, it is so important to rest. The Bible says to strive for rest. We are to contend and to strive for only one thing in scripture and the striving thing, and it is for rest. And rest doesn't necessarily mean sleep, but it's a posture. It's a position of waiting. It's a position of resting on God. It's a, think of it as soaking. You take a sponge and you put it in a, in, a, in, a, in a bucket of water. What's going to happen? It's going to soak in that water. We're supposed to take moments where we just abide. We rest and we soak in the things of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Because, that, because that's how we get strength. We get strength from the presence of the Lord. It, Psalm 1611 uh, says, In the presence of the Lord is the fullness of joy. You get your joy. The joy of the Lord is our strength. You get that by being in His presence. Rest is so key. It's so important. 
Verse 32. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. But many who saw them leaving recognized and ran on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them because they were like a sheep without a shepherd. So he began teaching them many things. So it is so important. The crowds will always be there. The people will always be there. And Jesus always has compassion. But it is so important to recognize those moments of rest. You got to take full advantage of them because you never know when suddenly things are going to begin to pick up. Verse 35, because we got to be ready in season and out of season. Verse 35, by this time it was light in the day, so his disciples came to him. And, th and this is a remote place, they said, and it's already very late. Send the people away so they can go to the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered, you give them something to eat. It's interesting Jesus' response. You do it. You give them something to eat. Jesus is trying to communicate a lesson to them. I just gave you authority to cast out demons, to heal the sick, and to preach the message of the kingdom. To preach the message of the kingdom. And now they're acting like they're completely helpless and they're oblivious to what is now possible to these men. And so Jesus uses this as an opportunity to confront their faith. Remember, this is a conflict of faith. And so they just moved in, 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 in power for the hour, but then after the power of the hour, it's like they're absent of all faith and power. And so Jesus now says, you give them something to eat. He's challenging them to begin to see and perceive with different eyes. Because you see, we don't see with our natural eyes. Because faith is the substance of things that are hoped for. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. Faith sees in the spirit realm. And then they said to him, that would take eight months wages. Are we not going to sp spend that much on bread just to give them something to eat? See, they missed what Jesus had. Jesus had compassion on them. And now they're not seeing through the eyes of faith. They're seeing through the eyes of the flesh and their own selfishness. Now, verse 38, he says, how many loaves do you have? And then he says, go and see. For when they found out, they said, they had five bread and two fish. Now, this is interesting. When you begin to look at these barley loaves of bread, they're unlike our modern loaves. These were small and flat loaves of bread, okay? They're not these big, nice, plush things. These are like pancakes, and one could easily eat several at a single meal. You see, these, this was cheap bread that was given to the poor. And so you usually could eat like eight or so of these in a single meal. So when you say you have five, that could maybe feed, you know, a young person. So, this is, so when they're saying that they only have five pieces of bread and two fish, they're really saying they don't have much. Now, then Jesus, you know, he, he directed them. To have the people sit down in groups on the grass. So they go and they sit down in the groups. And you got hundreds over here and fifties over here. And, and if they counted them all up, they were able to get a count of over 5,000 men alone. And then there's also women and children. We see that from the other gospels. And it's interesting. So now we have those five loaves and those two fish. And he look, Jesus takes them and he looks up towards heaven. And he blesses them. He gives thanks. And he broke the he broke the the loaves and then he gave them to the disciples to set before the people and he also divided the two fish from among them and they all ate and they were all satisfied what thousands of people now ate from from what basically would have been one meal for one person it now is multiplied over five thousand times see jesus is trying to show and to reveal them how to confront the issue of faith here because sometimes we have faith for a moment and then we lose it and then we start walking in this conflict of faith we start having this conflict of faith one day we're, we're casting out demons and, and 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 we're calling on people to repent and then the next day and we don't even know how to feed five thousand people and now here you see jesus demonstrating this then immediately jesus made his disciples get into a boat 
to go on ahead of him to Bethsaida. Now this is interesting. He sends them out on, on a mission, so to speak. He sends them out on a journey. Okay, you guys go and get this boat and go cross to Bethsaida. Go over there. And while he dismissed, and, and he did this while he dismissed the crowd. And after leaving them, he went on a mountainside to pray. This is an important factor. You see, Jesus never did anything without, without consulting with the Father first. Because only, Jesus only did what he saw the Father doing. And because Jesus only saw what, he, what the Father was doing, he always was operating with the gift of faith. Because he was already in tune with the Lord. So he would go by himself. And he would get alone, and he would listen to what the Father would say. And see, it's in that place of intimacy, that place of faith connecting, being plugged into the Father, that Jesus could then get the blueprint on what God was doing for the next, for this, for the next sequence of action that we see here in the Scripture. See, Jesus always did what he saw the Father doing. He did that in his humanity. Even though he was 100% God, he was still a human. And so he's modeling it here for the disciples. And he's modeling it now for us as we read it here in the text. Jesus went away on the mountainside to pray. Even as he transitioned between different movements. Because he only did what he saw the Father do. You don't see him stopping and then going off and doing something else in between until the Father speaks. No, he was intentional to go be alone with the Father. This is such a key thing, a key piece here we find in here in the scripture. And then verse 47 says, When the evening came, the boat was in the middle of the lake, and he was, al and he was alone on land. And he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. So now he sees them. Far off in a distance, and they're straining, and they're and they're they're doing their oaring and trying to get to Bethsaida on the other side. And it's three to six o'clock in the morning. Now you got to understand it because it says in about fourth watch of the night. You know, at fourth watch of the night, it's between three to six a.m. in the morning. So now you get, it's really early in the morning or really late at night, depending on uh, what your time cycle is or your sleep. And so here you see Jesus is watching them as he stayed up all night praying to the Father. And so he decides, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to, towards them. So now Jesus, it says, he went out to them walking on the lake. Jesus was not able to walk on the lake just at any moment. This proceeds from what we see here with verse 46. After leaving them, he went the mountainside to pray. He only did what he saw the Father doing because he, because he saw what the Father was doing. He now had the blueprint and to act on the faith that God was giving him. So now he goes and he's now walking on the lake. He's now walking on the word that he received from the Father. And so now he walks and he says he was about to pass by them. It's interesting. Jesus is going to just walk right on by. Right to Bethsaida. But, that's what it says in verse 49. But when they saw him walking on the lake, they thought he was a ghost. And they cried out because all they saw, because they all saw him and were terrified. It's interesting that this is their reaction. They've seen Jesus multiply the loaves. They've, they've, they've been able to cast out demons and heal the sick and perform miracles after watching him do it. And him now commissioning them to go do the same thing. They've already been performing these miraculous signs and yet... They're terrified seeing him walk on the water because they don't understand who he is and what he's doing. They think he's a ghost. It's interesting because, again, faith sees. They're having a conflict of faith because their discernment, their ability to perceive and understand what was taking place was still distorted. So they're still seeing through distorted eyes. They're still seeing this thing distortedly. They're not seeing correctly. They're not seeing with the eyes of faith. So immediately he spoke to them. He says, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. That's a word for somebody tonight. You've been going through so much. The circumstances and everything in your life and everything around us is everything that can be shaken has been shaken. Seems like you might be in the middle of the night in between jobs. Something's going on in your home life. Think, think things aren't right in your relationships. You're worried about your health, your health conditions. Maybe you're, maybe you're having breathing problems right now. You know, the Holy Spirit just says this. Take courage. It is I. Do not be afraid. The Holy Spirit wants to minister to you tonight. 
But wherever it is that you're at and whatever it is that you're going through personally, God wants to minister to that place, to that hurting, broken place. The Holy Spirit wants to breathe on you tonight. He wants to encourage you. Take courage. You know how many times the scriptures actually say that? Take courage. It's because a lot of times we don't have this because we have this conflict of faith. We, it's like we have some faith but not enough faith and so then we lack courage. But Jesus is saying, take courage. Don't be afraid. There's so many incidents, incidences. You look in the Old Testament. He encourages Moses to encourage Joshua. Take courage. Angels come. And people are like, ah! Immediately it's, don't be afraid. Take courage. This happens throughout scripture. We need to be encouraged. And we need to take courage. Because there's this conflict of faith that is taking place right now. But a house divided against itself cannot stand. It is so important. It's imperative, literally, that we begin to take courage and take hold of the gift of faith. And he says, don't be afraid. And then he climbed in the boat. You know, re remember it said that he was about to pass by them in verse 48. But now he climbs in the boat. Why? Because they were afraid and he, they needed to be encouraged. He had compassion on them. And the very thing they didn't have for the 5,000. It's so important. You know, you can't miss the fact that God wants to ha and, and releases compassion on us because that's his heart. So he gets in the boat because he has compassion and with them. And then it says, then, then the wind died and they were completely amazed. You know, there's this thing about faith. When you begin to see faith move in operation, those that don't. Those that are having and are experiencing a conflict of faith are always amazed because it surpasses their, their, their faith capacity at that point. Mm -hmm. The Bible says that every, Jesus said everyone's been given a measure of faith. So everyone has been given a measure of faith. You have a measure of faith. Now, maybe you have level one faith. Maybe someone else has a level ten faith. What you do with the faith that God has given you, you're responsible for that. And what you do with it, you can multiply that talent of faith. You can multiply that minus of faith. You can multiple that. You can multiply your faith. You can get, cause an increase to happen to your faith. You got to nurture it. You got to foster it. You got to grow it. You can't let your heart get bitter. You can't be offended, and you can't let your heart get hard. That's key. When, when we're talking about the conflict of faith. Because faith always is, is confrontational. Because it, because it breaks open another kingdom into this earthly realm. You've got to understand that see, the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. And when you plug into Jesus, because I mentioned earlier that faith is plugging into Jesus. When you plug into Jesus, you're bringing in another kingdom into the earth realm. And it makes things look a lot different. Everything about your life shifts as you begin to perceive a new reality into the circumstances that are before you. And it's interesting. He climbs into the boat with them, and the wind died down. And they were completely amazed, for they had not understood about the loaves, and their hearts were hardened. See, this is a key verse here. Their hearts were hardened. You think back to the beginning of this chapter. They took offense at him because they rejected the package. Sometimes people are expecting Jesus to be a different kind of Messiah. Sometimes people don't see Jesus for who he is. Some people want, they want to make Jesus king by force. Some people expect him to be a political figure. Some people expect Jesus to be their genie in a bottle. I pray this in Jesus and I get my three wishes. I mean, some, people get weird ideas about who they want Jesus to be. But when you just let Jesus be Jesus and you submit and come under that, you begin to receive differently. So we got to check our hearts because our hearts, when they become hardened, that there's no faith that moves in that realm. And Jesus is trying to teach these 12 disciples that have hardened the hearts on how to move and operate in faith. Now, when they crossed over, they landed. And they anchored there. And as soon as they got out of the boat, the people recognized Jesus. 
the people recognized him because they had faith. For them, there was no conflict. So you see this conflict in, 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 in chapter 6. Of, there are those that have faith and those that don't have faith. Or have some version of faith. But they recognized Jesus. And they ran throughout the whole region. And they carried sick, the sick on mats to wherever they heard that he was. So if they heard he was over here, they were going to carry people on mats. You know how heavy a person is? To be carrying them on a mat, that uneven weight, 150, 200 pounds, you're carrying people. Maybe, you know, maybe even that, in that time, uh, you know, you might have been getting somebody that was, you know, more of a cripple, might be missing a limb or something. But, you know, people are heavy, man. And you'd be carrying people from town to town because they're crippled. And, and then it says in verse, um, just because they heard he was there. They didn't even have confirmation. They, they couldn't pick up their cell phone. I mean, just picture this for a moment. They don't have a cell phone. They don't have the internet. They don't have computers. So they can't be like, hey, yeah, so-and-so there. Oh, Jesus is there. I'm coming. I mean, they didn't have Facebook and Instagram and all these awesome things to be able to just be like, oh, let, dude, we got a FaceTime and, 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 and let's, let's share this. No, they didn't have any of that information. So just off a word of mouth that they hear that Jesus is there, they begin to activate their faith. Dude, pick him up. Let's take him. Let's take him. So they begin to activate this thing. And wherever he went, into villages, towns, and the countryside, the people placed the sick in the marketplaces. This is key because Jesus was trying to teach the disciples about a marketplace anointing. Jesus wants to meet us in faith, by faith, through faith, in the marketplace with a marketplace anointing. Because the church is, is supposed to not just hold the anointing within the four walls of a church building. We're supposed to take it out into the marketplace to display the, 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 the demonstration of the kingdom. And as because there's there's there, this is the heart of God. He wants to bring the compassion to the people that have never heard the message of the good news. And he has a heart to demonstrate his love for them. And so this is a key thing when it said that, you know, the disciples hearts were hard because now you don't see Jesus releasing them to move in ministry because their hearts are hard. Now he's the one who's stepping in. Now the people are hearing about him. And so wherever he goes, the villages, the towns, or the countryside. So it doesn't matter if you're in the suburbs, you're in the city, or you're in the rural area, the farm area. Jesus can come and meet you right where you are. And Jesus has an anointing for the marketplace. And they begged him to let them just touch even the edge of his cloak. And all who were touched him. It doesn't say some. It says all who touched him were healed. Now, it's interesting. All. How is that possible that everyone was healed? Because the people were operating in faith. Because remember at the beginning of the chapter, it said that he was only able to heal a few sick people in his hometown. Because they rejected him and the package. But here, dude, they're bringing people to wherever he, they think he is. They've heard he is. And as such, what happens? The Holy Spirit begins to meet that faith, he begin, and, and he begins to heal all who were sick. Now, it's very interesting. This word healed means, is a Greek word called sozo. Sozo means healed, saved, and delivered. you got to understand, in Scripture, that's all the same thing. Saved, healed, and delivered. So God is literally saving, healing, and delivering each individual of whatever it is that they have. It's awesome. Because God wants to bring the sozo. He wants to bring that healing anointing into the marketplace. Hallelujah. I hope you enjoyed uh, tonight's teaching from the book of Mark chapter 6. The conflict of faith. This is, this is such a powerful, uh, I believe, text here. Is, is there's different stories, but they all run together with the same thing. I'm going to pray for you tonight. Hallelujah. That God would begin to just release something. Father, I thank you, Holy Spirit. That you can release unto the other people tonight the spirit of faith in, in, into Jesus. That all those that are sick in their homes, God, would be healed. I pray, God, for those that, 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 that are working, God, that, 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 that you would begin to just minister the anointing and the power and the fire of God 
into their workplace, whether it's uh, remote working or in-person working. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just meet them. I pray, God, right now that you would just begin to quicken the, the, the gift of faith on, in the lives of all those that are watching tonight, that you would begin to speak to them about the, the, the conflicts that we have in our own faith, and that you'd begin to just bring those, those, those points of conflict and, uh, uh, to a place of resolution, that we could all connect and be plugged into you, that we could be your voice in this hour, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, I'm going to uh, uh, transition here to let uh, Minister Alondra begin to share with you and pray with you uh, further. Alondra, come on. Amen. Aren't we thankful for Dr. Winter's study on tonight through Mark chapter 6? And just diving into that chapter for us and teaching us the importance of our faith and it being properly aligned. I took plenty of notes. I don't know if you guys took notes and have your notebooks out, but I took notes um, because I thought it was definitely a power-packed Bible study. Um, before I pray and dismiss us for tonight, I'm just making sure there aren't any announcements that we would be remiss not to mention. Um, our men's Bible study... They're still doing their Bible study on Zoom every Saturday morning. We want to encourage you men to connect with the men of CBSR and other men. It's not just for CBSR, but if you know somebody, a brother, a cousin, an uncle, a father, invite them to join the men on Saturday mornings. Um, the information to that Zoom study is on our website, and it's from 8 a.m. to 9 a.m. We also have our young adult Bible study on Thursday nights at 7 p.m., you can contact myself, Elandra at CBSR.org, or Minister JB, if you would like to get connected to that young adult Bible study. Um, we are also walking through the book of Mark in a more in-depth um, study and time to ask questions, and that's also via Zoom. And then we have our women's Bible study every other Saturday, 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m., um, and the next one would be March 6th, so that is this coming Saturday, I do believe, if my dates are right. And also, the Zoom information for that is found on our website. Also, ladies, if you haven't registered already, you can go ahead and start registering, if you haven't, um, for the Prayer Warrior Boot Camp that our women's ministry is hosting um, with LifePoint Church. So go ahead and get connected to that. And those appear to be all of our announcements. Again, we want to say thank you to everyone who made our annual corporate meeting happen, as well as those who um, attended. We were able to meet quorum, we were able to conduct business, and we were able to move forward. So that is definitely a hallelujah moment and an amen. So we say thank you for attending. Thank you for making all of that possible. And so I'm just going to go ahead and close this in prayer tonight. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up the stream. If you do have any prayer requests, you can go ahead and type them in if they're nothing too personal. If there's something you'd rather email us or it needs to be kind of um, confidential, go ahead and send that to C uh, office at cbsr.org or through our website. Just going to take a look here make sure. I don't see anything popping up as of yet. All righty. So God, we just say thank you. We say thank you for this time of study. Thank you for an in-depth look into your word to not only be hearers, but also doers of your word, God. Help us where we have our conflict of faith, God. Help us where our faith has been confronted with our realities, God. Help us to walk better into um, the knowledge of you and the understanding of you and to live according to your word and according to your purpose, God. I pray for the wayward believer in this season. I in this season, I pray for the person who's been weary, the person who's on the edge of giving up, the person who's been brokenhearted, who's been destroyed, who's dealing with depression, who's walking in darkness, God. We lift up all those different conditions, God, knowing that you are willing and able and more than capable to meet us in any condition that we present ourselves in, God. So I just pray for the strength of those who just need to get to the foot of the cross, God, that they find that strength in your word. They find that strength in just being in your presence, God, in the silence of your presence, God. They find the strength to just to crawl up to your cross and to crawl up to the hem of your garment, just to touch and to receive the power and the strength that they need to continue on 
We pray for those who are sick and any ailments that they may be facing, whether it's physical, mental, mental, emotional, God, or even spiritual, God. We come against the attack of the enemy in our bodies, in our minds, and in our words. God, we come against the attack of the enemy 